Guys, welcome to the podcast. I got a special guest for you today. Uh, her name is Sandy. She's with an organization that I just, I found completely by accident called Vested Canine. And um, we got a calendar, cal uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you about that in a second, Sandy. And, and I, I'm a big supporter of the police. I'm a big supporter of um, police dogs, p working dogs. I've trained working dogs. And um, when I saw this calendar, it just really struck a chord with me. You know, having run a nonprofit, I really find that very few nonprofits, in my opinion, I hate to say that, are really well suited or doing great jobs. Vested Canine is doing an amazing job. So I asked Sandy to come on the show and talk to you about that. So welcome to the show, Sandy. And uh, why don't I give you a few minutes and just talk about the uh, talk about your program, what you do. Give us the, the Reader's Digest elevator pitch on uh, on what you do. Well, thank you so much for uh, having me. I appreciate it. Vested Interest in Canines is a 501c3 nationwide nonprofit organization. And we were initially uh, formed to provide bullet and stab protective vests in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, we did that for about a year. And then as a result of nationwide outreach, we learned that there were dogs across the country that had the same needs as well as departments that didn't have budget to provide this life-saving equipment. So we expanded our mission about a year later and began helping dogs nationwide with the ballistic vests and have been proudly able to provide over 4,100 vests for dogs in every state. 4,100 vests. Yeah. Wow. Tell me for a second, because you, you kind of skipped over. How did you, your first dog, the first vest you ever gave to a police department, how did that happen? What, what was, give me the circumstances of how you came about this amazing um, it was It was a dog in Massachusetts. He was at the Department of Corrections, and that was over 20 years ago. And I still have the vest when the dog retired and then passed away the officer offered the vest back to me and I still have it um, oh. for me. It was the beginning of my passion for being able to help these dogs that do so much for us. Yeah, I agree. They do so much for us. I mean, I do think they love their jobs. Can we talk about that for a second? Some people um, will have the idea that these dogs are slaves, that they don't like what they're doing, that we're using them and stuff like that. Talk a little bit about, you have a lot of experience with this. How do you see these dogs? Do you see them thriving, loving their jobs? They do. That's all they want to do is work. They live to work and to please their handler. Um, that's their joy in life. They want to work, they want to do a job, and they have high drive. So mm -hmm. they love to play with the ball. They love to find the the narcotics they like to find the articles they like to to play with the toys they have a high drive right and so the so the first dog that you gave did something inspire you to like do this like did you hear of a dog being killed that you and you said this is not going to happen again on my watch i got an idea to give vests to these organ to these police departments i've always been an animal lover and um, over 20 years ago, I saw a show called Rain, and it was about a Vietnam War dog, and the, uh, the soldier was deployed with the dog, and when it was time for him to return home, he was not able to take the dog with him, and th that was concerning to me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel like they were a partnership, a team, and they should be able to return home together, and he went through many measures to get the dog home, and he finally did get the dog home. And that wow. piqued my curiosity about what were what what are some of the things or challenges that some of my local law enforcement agencies were facing. And I talked to them about that. And about way back when, about 20 years ago, um, they said that for their canine units, budgets were a concern, um, that they weren't able to necessarily afford the vests. And they were fairly new about 20 years ago. The technology has yeah. updated and changed greatly, but it was, it was a new thing. It was like a luxury for them to yeah. have a vest. So I felt like there was definitely a need because these dogs are first in the line of duty at times and, and their lives are on the line. They go in ahead of their human partners. So they need to have the same level of protection. Right. And is, is it, I mean, I'm sure a lot of departments, like I'm sure LAPD doesn't really need vests. Is there certain departments and, and why 
do some have a budget for this and some don't? I find it I find it incredible that a lot that more that 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 not every police dog that's sent out is wearing a vest. We see a lot of times that departments are raising funds to establish a canine unit. Mm -hmm. um, that's often the case, and it's mostly. I would say smaller size departments that are raising the money even to just purchase the dog right. and the vehicle and the necessary outfitting for the for the kennel that goes inside and even the kennel that they keep at home for the dog or the dog's food. So some programs are run entirely on donations. Mm, I didn't realize that. So smaller departments you're saying mainly don't have the budget for, for it and then they get assistance we, through donations? We see it often, yes. Mm. Wow. And so you started in, and I didn't even know you were in Massachusetts because I was born in Rhode Island, so I'm a fellow New Englander. Um, how did you expand it? So you started at a, at a small police department in Massachusetts, and then and that's obviously the smallest state in the Union, right? Rhode Island, but one of the smaller states. How did you expand from there to get other departments? Did the word just spread? It did. Social media had a lot to do with that. And uh, there was a media outlet that approached us about a situation that happened in the state of Connecticut. Um, Connecticut had an entity that was helping uh, police dogs with vests and it, it ended up on, uh, on the news um, because it wasn't working out as it was anticipated and the news outlet asked if what we thought about it and would we consider helping. And after we learned that the dogs were not getting the vest that they were slated to get, um, that really tugged at my heartstring because mm -hmm. I don't want any dog to be out there without the option of having a vest. I think every handler should have that option um, should they need percent. it. So, yeah, yeah. I so once I learned about that, um, it was decided that, yes, it's time to help dogs in other states. So Connecticut was the very next state, and we still work closely um, with many dogs in the state of mm -hmm. Connecticut. And, and you probably know a lot more about these vests than anybody else I'm going to have on this show. Um, tell me about the vests, because the, your vests are very unique in that they're stab and, and bullet resistant, right? Yes, they are. Um, we have a custom vest that is built for us by um, our manufacturer who is in Florida, and they're called Survival Armor. Um, we've been working with them for a number of years, and they customized a design for us that may, the vest is bullet and stab protective. Mm -hmm. um, it has two metal rings on the top of the vest that are called D-rings. So when the officer wants to use those as a tracking harness, they can use that. Okay. Um, it also has a handle on it, which helps them if they want to hoist the dog over a fence. Right. Um, and it also has an adjustment right under the dog's abdomen where they can tighten it or loosen it up and it, it tucks up inside the dog's body. So it's very streamlined, it fits them very close to their body. And for an average dog, it weighs about four and a half pounds. Oh, that's all. Yes. When that's I started awesome. doing this 20 years ago, it weighed at least double that. I was going to say, yeah, I remember the old bulletproof vest because I, I worked as a bodyguard. So the old ones were very, very heavy, very thick, cumbersome too. And they weren't stab resistant, right? Yes. These are, these are much lighter in weight. They're streamlined to the dog's body and, uh, they're thin, so the ballistics inside are thin, which makes mm -hmm. it easier for the dogs to move and do their job. For sure, because you have to consider, I mean, a dog weighs 60 to 100 pounds. If they're carrying around a 10-pound vest, that's a, that's a really heavy thing for the dog. Right. Right. Well, let me ask you this question, um, and this is the most common question I've always heard and the most common question that I would think in, in, in the immediate thought. The vest covers the, the body, obviously the center most mass, where for us, when we're standing up, that's probably where we're going to get hit. What, what have you seen with dogs? Are, is it a real common area because the dog's coming straight at the person? Isn't the head very vulnerable or susceptible to either a stab or a bullet? Um, it is the head, yes, but obviously there's no protective gear potential, potentially now for, right. you know, protection um yeah. also the neck um the neck and the back and the chest the so neck, it depends on chest. it depends on where the assailant is coming at you from yeah of course so do you see that i mean is there any cases where uh, the dog wasn't saved by wearing the vest where they did get hit in the head or the neck or anything like that 
Um, I have heard of cases, yes, where the dog has has received a gunshot wound to the head and did not survive. But more, more probably the dog will be saved because center mass is where they're going to get most impact, especially I would think stabbing, right? I mean, because when the dog is holding on to somebody and the person would take out a knife, they're going for that chest area or that the ribs yes. and stuff, right? Yes, we're, we're aware of um, five dogs that were saved as a result of the vest that we had awarded. Wow. I mean, what, what an amazing, amazing thing. And the vests are very cool looking, by the way. I mean, if you wanted to um, go to the website, it's VIK9S.org. And I, I can tell you, if you have whatever you can donate, you should donate. It just brings tears to my eyes looking at your site, Sandy. I mean, the, the amazing, amazing, amazing work you do is just monumental to me. I love, love what you're doing. It's it's really incredible. It's, it's life-saving. And it really protects the beings that protect us, right? I mean, police officers protect us, but they send in their officers and, and, and canines are police officers, right? Am I, am I wrong? They're considered police no, officers? No, they definitely, they definitely are. And the dogs spend more time with their human partner than their, than their families do. Mm -hmm. They're very yeah. strongly bonded together. Now, you sent me a clip of an amazing story that was on Inside Edition, and the link to that is on your website. And I'm going to put a link to the, to the website in the uh, video down below. And if you're listening to the um, podcast, the audio podcast, go to robertcabral.com. I'll have links um, on the podcast page to all of Sandy's amazing work through Vested um, Canines. It's, it's actually called Vested Interest in Canines, right? Yes. Okay, so, um, and because I think it is that important, um, it's, it's such an amazing donation you can make. Now, I believe you're a 501c3, so the, the, the donations are tax deductible? Yes, they are. Okay. Um, do, do, the, do the vests stay with the dog the entire um, duration of the dog's tenure at a department, or do they need to be changed often, or, or how does that work? So the vests have a five-year warranty on them, just like a human officer's vest, and most dogs in their career will need two. So okay. part of our program for the, the vest grant does allow the dog to apply for a second vest when their first one expires. Okay. And when you say the warranty, do, do you, are you saying it becomes less bulletproof or less stab resistant as time goes on? Is it a, is it a degeneration of the actual materials? Um, it will break down over time. It and will, it also will. exposure, exposure in time. So, um, for example, fluorescent lighting or extreme heat or extreme cold. Interesting. And what about water? They're obviously waterproof, but I mean, does water break them down as well? No, there's not any study about water. And a lot of these dogs do water training in them. Right. And uh, most of the dogs, I mean, obviously, I think, and I'm, I could be incorrect, but are, are most of these dogs dual purpose dogs that, where they're doing detection and apprehension work? Um, a majority of them are. I would say that we probably work with about 20% single purpose dogs and 80% dual purpose dogs. But, and, but you still provide, do, do you preferentiate for giving vests to dual purpose dogs over like, let's say a detection dog alone or do you, how does that work? No, no. Okay. Any dog needed. that has any certification who goes to work every day, or even if, um, the dog is working with a reserve officer, we work with reserve officers who, wow do this work out of the goodness of their heart, but their dog is still doing the same job. So we help the dogs based on what they do for work, even whether it's a single purpose or a dual purpose, we provide for both. And how do you select the dogs? I'm sure you must have tons of applications coming to you all the time for, for vests. How do you determine that's who gets a, That's there? a common question. And the answer <laughs> is not probably not what you think. Um, we don't select them. It's first in and first out. So they okay. fill out an application document and um, provide the necessary paperwork. We go through everything. And if they have completed all the necessary paperwork, then we award the dog a best. It's that simple. It is. So there's, there's no bureaucracy or anything like that. It's wow. simple. Tell me, it's very what does a vest cost? Like if somebody wanted to buy, could somebody buy one vest and put their name on like in honor of whatever? Do you, do you ever do anything like that? So we work with thousands of sponsors across the country who are very generous to us, and uh, we couldn't do this without them. And they are able to fill out a sponsor form, which allows them to suggest uh, a name of a department or maybe a dog that they might like to help. And if we do have a request from that department, we will try to match it up with that sponsor. Um, 
If not, then we would give it to the next dog in line. And sponsors do have an opportunity to put a custom embroidery on, on the vest. It goes right down the front of the dog's chest. So right here? Yes. This one, wow. And what, is, what would that donation be? I'd love to see people do this. I think it's so important. Like, it would be a great... Um, what, about a, what about a great tribute to a dog that you lost, that you loved, or your or family member? You know, how much would that cost? What, what would that donation be? Let's get some people to do that. Uh, $960 if they mail in the check or 985 if they opt to do it online. And many people do do it in memory of someone, you know, that's been special in their lives that they've lost or somebody that they want to want to honor, um, fallen officers or fallen canines or beloved pets or family members. And, and we're delighted to do that, to pay tribute, you know, to those wow. that were important in their life. I think that's a fantastic idea. I mean, what a great way to have a memory of your, your dog or somebody else live on and save a life and do something monumental for under $1,000. That's an, I know we're on tough times. I, I'm, I'm just saying there's plenty of people who could afford it, and I think it would be an amazing, amazing thing to do to donate to that. So um, do, are the vests, once they're done, they're discarded, and then a new one goes on? You said it has because of the five-year warranty you don't obviously it's very smart that you don't say well let's see if we get six or seven out of it and god forbid we lose a life because we're cheap what what happens then they turn that vest in and it's applied towards the next vest um they they'll turn it into us um or they'll actually use it but they can use it for testing purposes mm. should they have a, a range and they want to test it out they're welcome yep. to do that and then they will just go on our website and apply for another vest and uh, would you give those people preferential treatments since they've already had one? We would want to see those dogs suddenly without a vest, right? There's no difference in where they appear in the in the lineup in the okay. queue. There's no difference. Okay. And you said you've you've given up for, over 4,100 of these across the United States since you started. W what would we say at any given point? How many dogs are out there currently right now with with a vest on from from vested uh, interest in canines? Uh, the anticipated thought is about 30,000 active duty canines working. Wow. And how many of those would you have you provided vests for? Like, is uh, there a number like right now? Are there, is there 100 or 300 or different dogs out there with vests? Oh, for ones that are currently active? Yeah. I don't know if I have an answer for you. <laughs> Okay. It's just, I mean, it's just so, it's such an interesting idea because you are so, like you take, you, you, you would take an application from any state. You don't say, well, this is my home state. I'm going to go here first. You would go to any state and if they can qualify their dog, they're going to get a vest, right? Yeah. Yes. We work with dogs in Alaska, dogs in Hawaii. I mean, dogs everywhere. Uh, what's the most interesting breed of dog you've ever gotten a vest for? Um, I think one that I was most interested was a belgian tavern and that's oh, wow. a really unusual breed of dog um we have a, a fundraising calendar that we put out each year mm -hmm. and this particular dog breed is featured in our calendar this year and i was really delighted to showcase him because i don't know if a lot of people realize um that there are a lot of different breeds of dogs that do work in police mm -hmm. work obviously people are familiar with the german shepherd and maybe a labrador retriever but there are Belgian Malinois, we've worked with Rottweilers, German Shorthaired Pointers. Interesting. Um, we've worked with a lot of pit bulls too. They have been using pit bulls to do detection work and they're very strong at doing that. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of them. Um, there's giant schnauzers being worked for police dogs and Doberman Pinchers, but the Belgian Tavirin I think was very unusual because people had not even heard of that breed of dog before. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, we see it a lot in working dogs in, in the Belgian show ring, obviously, too. But, I mean, it's very interesting that they would use them because I think it's a softer dog than the Malinois. Well, the Malinois is such a hard, hard-hitting dog, the Dutchies and the German Shepherds. Um, <clears throat> are there any ever smaller dogs that do it? Um, yeah, there are some smaller dogs at times. There are. There's uh, Springer Spaniels that they're using. Hmm. And I want to make sure not to leave out the bloodhounds because that's one of my favorite breeds is the bloodhounds. Well, you have a picture of a bloodhound on the front. Of, I'm looking at your website right here on my tablet while I'm talking to you. And I think a bloodhound is one of the <clears throat> pictures in the slideshow that goes by. You, you see it. So you have a lot of German shepherds and stuff like that. And you guys, you have really cool um, gear, too. I'm noticing the shirt you're wearing. There's the bloodhound. Canine Sh Sherlock, right? In Jupiter, yeah, Florida. Sherlock. He's in Sherlock. Florida. <laughs> what a cool looking dog. Um, 
I was saying that you have really cool logo gear too. Uh, you're, it looks very, very cool. I, I love that. It's something that they can get off your site as well. Yes, absolutely. We have uh, we have various campaigns at various times. We pay tribute to fallen canine heroes once a year by making gear available for uh, two two weeks with uh, having the names of all the fallen canines on our on our backs with the tanks, tees, and hoodies, and we do that in January of every year. Well, that's coming up now then, isn't it? It's happening now. So are those shirts available currently or no? They are. They'll be available until January 26th. Well, God, we better get on. Uh, well, this I'm going to get this podcast up really soon. Today's the 15th. Hopefully we'll have it up um, in the next couple of days, and hopefully we can get some people to get those shirts. What a great, what a great tribute to do to the... I mean, what a sad thing, first of all, that any dog ever get, get stabbed or, or hurt. But um, I, what, what can people do or what should people know more about this, the importance of this? Because one thing I get a lot is people say, well, dogs don't want it. Dogs shouldn't have to work. It's animal abuse. Oh, you know, a lot of animal rights people, and there's good animal rights people, but there's also some that are quite psychotic who think that dogs should never have to work and stuff like that. How do we educate people... Um, about this 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 important work because you know I mean I know I, we know they love doing the work but I mean is, is there some other thing that we can kind of bring up to mention to them that's to me so important. Well, sometimes people have an opportunity to see canines working whether the community has a demonstration going on or perhaps um, they they attend a demo for the school for the children or what have you, to educate them. A lot of departments are very big into educating the general public about the importance and um, how the dogs help ensure community safety um, mm -hmm. with the work that they do. I mean, they find missing children and, and patients, elderly patients that may have left their, their facility. Um, sure. They help find um, suspects and they f take drugs off the street and guns and, uh, you know, explosives. yes, explosives, um, dogs do so many things. They also detect, uh, currency, mm -hmm. you know, do, they do work any, do any at of the, the dogs you work with. Do, yeah. I was going to ask you, so do you work with, um, airport police dogs as well? We do. Yes. Okay. So those yep, dogs will detect everything from even ivory and, and drugs, uh, firearms, and anything like that as well. Right. So here's a great uh, animal that's really helping keep the country safe because it's taking... And, you know, the one thing I remember, um, a, a friend of mine who, who's passed away since was a, was a canine trainer, and he said that back in the day when canines were really... This was going back 50 years, I guess, or 40 years... And he said when they were first introducing canines, the canines are actually what they call a less lethal force. So it's actually a benefit because if somebody's going to get bit by a dog, it's one thing. But if they get shot by a bullet, it's another thing. So actually deploying a canine is, is a real benefit to subdue an assailant without doing too much damage. Right. And many, and many people opt to not want to get involved with a canine and they just give up. Yeah. <laughs> it's usually a smart idea, right? Um, well, I mean, I, I do think they love it. Having trained dogs and worked with, with, with canines a, a bit, I think that I, I don't think a dog could have a happier life than, I mean, Goofy loves nothing more than to bite. You know, like if I can put, if I put him on a sleeve or on a bite suit, there's, he's almost 11 years old and you've never seen a dog act younger than when he gets to go do that work. And I, I think that's really just what these, do, these working dogs do, whether they're detecting or they're, they're apprehending. I think um, it's just the, the most fun thing they can do. Now, do you have a dog? I know you mentioned you have cats. I don't have a dog, but wow. I will say that I have 4,100 dogs. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> have you ever wanted to get a, a, a working dog? Like a, so you'd have that kind of energy with you? Or do you just think like, okay, I'm going to stay detached from it? Um, many years ago, I had a dog. I'm not sure if that would fall into my life again. I normally do a lot of traveling. So I do get an opportunity to meet the dogs and the handlers that we work with. So um, that's been really fulfilling for me. And if you, if you haven't seen um, the Inside Edition story on um, the website of, of Vested Interest in Canines, you owe it to yourself to watch this, but I'm going to tell you right now, if you're going to watch it, have a box of tissues, because I was watching it with Janet, and I mean, this is real tough cop, and he starts talking, and he starts tearing up, and then I started tearing up, and I was just so powerful to watch the story. I'm not going to say anything else about it, but 
man, if you want to see what an amazing thing and importance it is for a dog to have a vest, you got to watch that video. You got to just, I mean, take a couple minutes out of your day, go to vikanines.org and, um, and watch this video. If you, whether you decide to support the amazing work that, that they're doing or not, just watch the video and share it because I think it's going to give you an, an insight into how important this work is. And they're, they're going to be out there. I think, you know, I think canines are super important to our society to keep us safe, to protect police officers. And also it's a job they love, love, love to do. They're not being forced because if they were being forced, they'd be off the force. I mean, they, you can't force a dog to do this kind of work. Um, and I think I, you got to watch that video. It's just to me, just just awesome, awesome work. Um, let me ask you, how would a police department get in touch with you, Sandy, about if they needed a vest? Is, can they also go to your website and, and apply there? Yes, everything's on our website. There's a section that says uh, qualify for a vest. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one of several programs that we have. We do have other programs available, such as medical insurance for the dogs. And we provide first aid kits and uh, Narcan. Uh, which is an opioid reversal kit in case oh, okay. the dogs have uh, ingested any uh, narcotics. No, that's something that's really important. I want to talk about for a second. So I, I didn't know that. So you're, you're actually providing the Narcan as well as all these other things, because talk about that for a second, um, how that happens and how deadly that can be for a dog. So sometimes the dogs um, come in contact with the narcotic because they are looking to detect it and other times it happens when they are not looking to detect it and potentially mm -hmm. they can overdose just like a human so mm -hmm. to have access to the the narcan kit is really important for the officer um to have it and we provide a kit that it has two doses four milligram doses of nasal narcan and oftentimes they may need to use both of those doses as they're on their way to the vet to get their dog treatment mm -hmm. to save the dog's life and let's face it, drug uh, dealers are not nice people. I've heard oftentimes of dogs being set up where they will put some of that into food to, get, to kill the dogs. There's been a number of dogs that have had to use the Narcan that yeah. we're aware of. And how many of those, and like how much does one of those kits cost to, 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 to donate? So what we do is we provide this program once a year. We're getting ready to roll it out again for 2021. Mm -hmm. And we generally buy 500 Narcan kits and it's first come, first serve. And they also um, apply on our website. Uh, the program's about a $50,000 program. Wow. So it's about a hundred bucks per kit. So if you can't afford yep. a vest for a thousand bucks, you could drop a hundred bucks and, and potentially save a dog's life again. So, well, listen, is there anything else you want to talk about? I mean, I, I could talk to you all day about dogs and with, with anybody who comes on my show. I just love, love, love talking about dogs. Is there anything else you want to bring up and talk about? Because I'm glad we brought up the Narcam kit because that's so huge that for a, you know, a smaller donation, you can have a huge impact as well. Yeah, as there's a couple yeah. of things I like to point out. One of them is about the medical insurance. That was mm -hmm. a program that we started in 2016 called Healthcare for Canine Heroes. And that program is available to canines who have received the best from our program and they, they qualify on our website. But a lot of times these dogs are subject to, to getting injured in the line of duty and whether they need testing or whether they need surgeries or medication or other kinds of therapies to help them like physical therapy. Um, we pay the premium for the health insurance for a whole year um, so that the officers personally, if they own the dog personally or from a department standpoint, are not required to pay any premiums and uh, they get the medical insurance just like humans have medical insurance. And we've been able to expand our program. We have over 100 dogs on it now. Wow. Well, I'm floored. I think your organization is amazing. I think what you do is amazing. I hope everybody who listens to this will at the very least go to your website, um, v Vested Interest K9, V I K 9 S.org. Um, watch the inside edition piece. It's amazing. Peruse you don't want me to it. talk about that, huh? <laughs> Go ahead. No, I wish you would. I just didn't want to blow. Nope. But yeah, if you want to talk about it, you can. <laughs> I, I will. Tell me. Um, in December of 2018, I was made aware of a dog in Jonesboro, Arkansas, that was 
shot in the line of duty five times. His name was K-9 Gabo, and he was with the Jonesboro Police Department, and his officer's name is Eric Johnson. Um, it was a it was a suspect barricade situation, and the dog was shot at close range five times. He was wearing the vest that we donated. Um, I don't know if I can recreate the feelings that I felt when the officer let me know what happened. Um, he let me know the very next morning as he was sitting by himself at the vet's office in the kennel, laying there with the dog who had emergency surgery, not knowing what the fate would be of canine Gabo. And he let me know what happened. And I was ready to get on a plane and go there. Um, just knowing that this happened to him and a, a miracle occurred. Three days after this dog sustained five gunshot wounds, he walked out of the vet's office. He went home, he jumped in the Eric's truck by himself and he went home to heal with his family. Um, I don't know about I don't know about miracles, but I certainly believe in them because of all the trauma he endured and the great people that took care of him at the animal hospital and his handler that took good, good care of him and a lot of prayers and a vest. Um, he went home in three days. Um, we posted that video on our social media pages and it got over 3 million views, 3 million views of people supporting this dog. And in two months, he went back to work full duty. Wow. Um, the resilience, the drive, the love for the job that he did and wanting to be back at work at his partner. I had an opportunity to go to Arkansas and meet Officer Johnson and Gabo about nine months after this happened. And during that time, Eric and I became friends. We spoke almost every day. And he said, I want to join your mission. I want to help because I think every dog out there should have a vest like my dog because you saved his life. And we made sure that every dog in that area had a vest. And so when I went, I had the opportunity to meet each of those dogs and the handler. And I was greeted at the airport by K-9 Gabo and Eric. And I can't even tell you the emotions, it's still emotional for me now, mm -hmm. um, to touch that dog and feel him in my hands and just mm -hmm. touch his fur and hug him and, and know he was okay. Amazing, just amazing. And I had an opportunity to go to the Jonesboro Police Department and meet with the chief. And he let me hold the vest in my hands that was covered in blood and touch the nine millimeter round that was stopped by the vest. Um, unbelievable. The yeah, most emotional thing I have ever experienced. Yeah. Oh, it's I mean, what a way to know that you're doing something amazing, right? I mean who who else can really see that and feel that and touch that and experience that and you have a living warm body of a dog that's alive because of something that you did and and i feel like i have a person that i am bonded to for the rest of my life because he had the opportunity to get a vest he got the yeah. vest and he made yeah. sure his dog was wearing it and it saved his life what an amazing love that shows from this police officer for his canine. I mean, that, that's just insane. Like how much, you know, the connection, the, just talk to me about that connection that you see between the police officer and his canine. Because we see, you know, I, I remember a couple of years ago, there was a story of a police officer who left his dog in the car and it, the car overheated, not knowing people, I should say, not knowing that there's actually air conditioning, there's alarms and all these, there's so many security pieces in place for these dogs um, that accidents do happen, obviously. People have accidents all the time. But what I want you to just touch on, because you probably have a lot of experience with this, is what is that like feeling like? What is that bond between a police officer and his or her canine? It's like a, it's like a very strong understanding between the two that the officer will protect his dog and the dog will protect his handler at all costs. Um, it's extremely strong. The dog can, can read the body language of the officer. Um, they understand the officer's commands, whether it's verbal or hand signals. Um, and they, they understand it's, it's really an unspoken language between the two of them. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, it's, it, but there, I don't think there is a stronger bond. I mean, we all love our dogs. I love my dogs, and, and a lot of trainers and, and owners love their dogs. But I think that bond for a person who spends more time with that that dog than they probably spend with their wife and children. They um, do. It's not just like a, it's not like a, a firearm or or a car. It's like the most amazing bond in the world. It's their best friend. Every police officer I've talked about, their police canine partner is their heart and soul it's there's no strong and these guys are tough to bond with i mean they're cops they're they're rugged tough real guys who don't take a lot of gruff you know who are, who are quite gruff and strong but man you see want to see a police officer melt you want to see a real man melt you talk to them about their police their, their police canine partner and they just they turn into little boys yeah and it's part of their family the dog is part yeah. of their family 100 percent I love it. And, I mean, and many, and many times they're bonded with their family members, you know, their right. other family members as well. And they're protective of their family members. They the understand canine. that that's their pack. Yeah, yeah. The canine actually is is part of the, the police officer's family. Yes. I want to stress that because they live at home. They don't live in a kennel somewhere and they go pick them up. This police officer takes the dog home with them. They feed them. They walk them. They cuddle with them. They're on the couch with them. They're bonding with their children and their wife or husband, whatever it is. And there is no bond like that. I don't think any pet dog is as happy as a police officer's dog at getting to be with, you know, most people leave, go for work for eight hours a day, but a police officer takes that partner with him back and forth. So they're together pretty much 24 seven, right? Right. And they do a lot of training together. They do a lot of mm -hmm. training. They do a lot of playing. Mm -hmm. They they do a lot of connection together. And even when they have a day off, they're still doing training together. They mm -hmm. might be playing ball or they might be taking them on a on a track or a, on a, uh, you know, on a hike or something like that. Or they might take them swimming. Yeah. Yeah. They're always doing they're something always together. Yeah, I think it's amazing. I just, I love police canines. I mean, I, I love all dogs, but I mean, I have a soft spot in my heart for any military or, you know, or hardcore working dog like that, because I really think originally when dogs were domesticated, they were domesticated to do a job. And I think, don't think they're ever happier than when they're doing a job, you know, so. I've been, I've been exposed to many of these dogs and I will tell you, I've seen so many happy dogs and so many happy handlers and how proud they are of the work that their dogs do with them and they should be yeah they should be i mean you know thank god for our police officers for our first responders for our military god bless all of them i mean you know give thanks to them for your freedoms you have no matter what side of the political side you're on give thanks to the people who protect you and protect your rights and protect this great country of ours and and thank you sandy for what an amazing thing i hope you'll come back on if you have you know another story you want to share with us because um, I well, think my viewers would love thank this. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, listen, one more time. Vested interest in canines. V-I-K-9, the number 9, V-I-K, and the number 9, S, dot org. Go to the site, whatever you can afford, 10 bucks, 100 bucks, or God, if you can do it, do the $985 and, and buy a vest. Put your mom or your dad or your brother or your dog's name on it and, and share your love for dogs with another dog, with a dog that's saving and will save lives. So your gift will keep on giving. Um, stay in touch with me, Sandy. I just, I love, I love our conversation. Thank you. I will. Thank you so much.